Good morning, church, and thank you for following along with us on these Sunday mornings together. Just have a, a couple of uh, announcements to make before we um, move over to the, the kids' talk part of our, our time together. First one is to remind you, or, or maybe to fill you in for the very first time, that we have a, a church blog, which is people within the church writing a, a variety of articles um, about faith in the midst of lockdown and things that they found helpful and pieces of scripture that's encouraged them. And we'll put a, I'll put a link for it in the description box below if you haven't already been on the, the church blog, spi- blog site. Um, and you can just click on that and it'll take you there and you can see what different folk have been uh, speaking about and writing about. Also, if you haven't noticed already, this coming Thursday evening as a church body, as a fellowship, um, some of the the ladies within the fellowship have decided we're going to do a a quiz. And again, if you go over to our Facebook page, there's um, some postings on there which will give you information about it. It's going to be done via Zoom. Uh, It's just a social thing uh, and a chance for us to to see one another and just have some uh, fun together by means of a quiz. If you go over to our Facebook page, um, if you're not on Facebook, you can email the church office and the, the email address the church office, again, we'll put in the description box below and you can email us to get some information about that if you'd like to, to take part. So with that said, we're going to um, have our kids talk part now. Thank well, you. Good morning, church. Once again, I am joined by Bethany. It's very kind of her to keep helping and to people to keep commenting that she should come back. So mm-hmm. here she is. However, this week she's promised to behave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Um, one of the things that we have been asked um, by one of the mums in uh, Sunday school is that it would be a good idea because we've got all these um, support the NHS with the rainbows in the windows. And one of the mums from Sunday school thought it would be a good idea, if, as well as the rainbows in our windows, if that we were put to put up um, rainbow coloured crosses. An example can be seen right here. That's very good. You don't look like you're fully convinced on this one. Do you know what's mm-hmm. in your nice coloured rainbow to go in the window? I do. Okay. Well, we can see Betty's enthusiastic <laughs> this morning. Um, however, I've got something that will get you in a really good mood. Okay. Because one of our, um, one of the families that come along to the church, um, the Marples, Adrian is a very, very accomplished musician. He has taught some people to, to sing and to play music uh, who are now very, very famous. And he is renowned for his work with his fingers. However, this time he's learned to play a chanter. What's that? A chanter is like bagpipes without a bag. So it's just a pipe? So Adrian's going to play <laughs> a pipe um, and this is what he sounds like. <laughs> 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 What do you think of that new talent that he's learned? Interesting. <laughs> Are you suggesting maybe either you should practice more or stick to the piano? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, good try, Adrian. Anyway, we're glad you, you sent in your video and allowed us to use it. Um, however, if we had buzzers on Britain's Got Talent, it would be... <coughs> yeah, so that would be that. <laughs> however, we have had a video, video sent in um, from the McKinnons, um, and we will... Get out of the way and we will let you watch it and then we will read for you what Mari put with it. Thank you. Okay, 
um, thank you for them, to the McKinnons for sending in the video. And what they wanted to add was, this is a little bit that goes with it. We are living in tricky times. Sometimes our walk may be an uphill struggle, like they were running uphill. Mm -hmm. It's good that you're warm, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And didn't get his pizza. Yeah, he did chat out. He was going to go and get his pizza. Sometimes we, our walk may be an uphill struggle. We might feel out of control, but God, he is fully in control, always present, and gives us what we need for the times we are in. And then Mari said she quite liked the bit where Joel said, take a step of faith to encourage Ellie to get down the hill. Good. Yep. Well, thank you both, uh, both Ellie and Joel for that, and Mari for, for filming it. And I think we have managed to finish this without doing anything silly, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Good. Hang on. Do this. Why would I do that? When I press they this, were finished. No, no, no. <laughs> when I press this, you have to say chicken. Yeah. And when I press this, you have to say leg. And when I press this, you have to say wing. Chicken, leg, wing. wing. Okay. Yeah. Chicken, leg, wing. Chicken, chicken. Chicken, chicken. Chicken, leg, leg, leg. Wing, wing, wing. Hello. <laughs> Goodbye, boys and girls. She's not coming back next week. Okay, before we come into the, the Word together, I want to pray for us and ask that the Lord would help us and that His Word may indeed touch and do what it does. It, it has the power to transform our lives. As we thought about during the week in our Bible study together, that the truth of the gospel is people can change. And it's through the means of God's Word attended by the ministry of His Spirit that that change takes effect in our lives. So let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You for who You are. We thank You that You are a God who speaks, that You are a God who is full of love for creatures like us who are made in Your image after Your likeness. Father, we thank you that your desire for us is that we improve, that we are transformed, that the sin within us is removed from off of us, that made possible by what your Son has accomplished on the cross and in his living. Father, so as we would attend to your word together even now, might your Spirit be with us wherever we are at this particular moment. And may the Spirit take these words and use them to bring transformation in our lives. Father, as we look at these words which are so sacred and yet so powerful, help us and minister to us, we pray. Keep us from leaving this time unchanged or unmoved by what we find in these words. And may your truth wash over us, renewing us for the glory of your Son, we ask. Amen. The importance of some moments can often be misinterpreted or simply missed altogether. In 1833, the Slavery Abolition Act was passed not long after William Wilberforce's death. He, he lived long enough just to hear of its third reading in Parliament, but he did not live long enough to see it passed into law. In 1833, slavery was abolished right across the British Empire. Yet it would be misinterpreting what had happened or misunderstanding what took place to say this then was the end of slavery. There are more slaves in the world today than there have ever been before. On November 4th, 2008, in America, Barack Obama became president-elect by beating John McCain in the presidential race. After his induction, Jesse Jackson stated that this was the last lap 
in a 60-year-long race, suggesting that Martin Luther King's dream that one day his children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He was suggesting that dream was in its final phase. It was about to be fulfilled. That was in 2008, 12 years ago. And we can see that was a misinterpretation of what was happening just by watching our news channels today. The most significant moment in the history of the world was the 33 and a half years in which God dwelt upon it as one of us. He is the most significant figure in our history. And in this portion of Mark's gospel that we're going to read in a moment, we find the most significant figure in the history of the world standing in what at that moment was the most significant place on the face of the world until three days later. The place of most significance is no longer the temple. It's his cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. In Mark's gospel from Mark chapter 11 and verse 27, all the way through to the end of Mark chapter 12, we have the most significant figure in human history, Jesus Christ, in the most significant place on the planet, which is the temple in Jerusalem. So the most significant figure in human history, in the most significant place on the planet, and what he spends his time doing in this place at this moment is answering the various questions that are posed to him. Uh, until finally, when we reach the point that no one dares to ask him any more questions, he begins to take the lead in the discussions that are happening in the temple. So this is what we read. Mark chapter 12 and verse 35. So Mark's gospel, chapter 12 and verse 35. And here is the most significant figure in human history, in the most significant place on the planet, and suddenly he gets to lead what the discussion is about. He begins to teach, and this is what he says. Verse 35, And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that Christ, that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive greater condemnation. So here we have Jesus, from verse 35 down to verse 40, leading the discussion in the temple, and it's a moment that we don't want to misinterpret or miss the importance of. That This is the one time when he's in the temple, the most important place on the planet, the most significant figure in human history. And this is him beginning to lead the discussion, beginning to teach. He could have taught on any number of subjects. And yet, what in essence he says is this. Beware of the scribes. You think, really? Of all the things that you could have spoken about, beware of the scribes. Could have taught on anything. Uh, and yet the, the kernel, the heart of his teaching, beware of the scribes. 
I mean, okay, maybe in the first century, this, this would have been very, very appropriate for them and very, very necessary for them. But we don't live in the first century. And we don't have scribes knocking around the place. So, so how is the teaching of Jesus, this most significant figure in history, in the most important place on the planet, beware of the scribes, how is that in any way relevant to me when there are no scribes around about me in, in my life or in my group of friends? I have to challenge my own thinking on that. And the statement that I've made when I said, there are no scribes in our context, by saying, actually, there are. There are people around me who fulfill the role of scribes. You see, the scribes were people who influenced two things. The scribes influenced what people believed and how people behaved. The scribes influenced belief and behavior. That that's the role that they, they fulfilled in the time of Jesus. We know that because the very first time in Mark's gospel when Jesus has finished teaching and we hear about the response of people to his teaching, this is what we read. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, and verse 21. And they, that's Jesus and the disciples, went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they, that's the people, were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. So the very first comparison that is made with Jesus in teaching is with the scribes. And the, the role that the people who normally fill the role of teachers are the scribes, which means the scribes are those who influence what people believe. And if you can influence what people believe, you will then influence, as we're going to find out, how people actually behave. And what Jesus is saying here is, beware of the scribes. Now, we, we all like to think that we haven't been that influenced by people around us. We may like to think that, but it's just not true. And what Jesus is saying here is, beware, look out for, pay attention to those who influence what you believe and therefore how you behave. Let's think about behavior first of all. Given the exponential increase of influers, influencers on account of the world wide web, this teaching of Jesus I don't think has ever been more necessary for us to hear. One of the things that Jesus made clear here in verse 38 when he said, and in his teaching he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and, and the greetings. They like to be seen. That's one of his warnings. These, these scribes, these influencers, they love to be seen. They, they love to be visible. They love the, the presence on the public platform, as it were. Jesus in Mark's gospel is often found seeking a desolate place. The scribes are the opposite. They're seeking the public platform that they want to be seen in order to influence. The, the exposure, they love it, they like it, they like being noticed. It's so important to them. Nowadays, that would translate into how many followers you have or how many views that you're actually getting. At the beginning of, of lockdown, my children introduced me to uh, a thing on the, the internet, an app called TikTok. And it's, it's fascinating. I mean, some of the things are hilarious, and yet it is so, so sad 
to see people who have literally thousands of followers begging for more. It's all about getting more and more followers. And all these people do is try and influence other people. Now, like I said, some of it is fun. And yet much of it is so sad because all you have is people seeking to influence others by displaying themselves. That's what these scribes liked. It's about being seen, being visible. And Jesus said they love to walk around in their their long robes. The, The focus here is on these flowing robes. That the whole focus is outward. How, how do I seem to others? How do I present myself to others? What should I wear? You, you know, if you like go along to a a, a church, uh, and their first response or their or their 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 main thinking is what you're wearing more than the state of your heart. I have one piece of advice for you: leave, go someplace else. That the most important thing is not the outward appearance, it's the heart. Beware of the scribes. For them, it's all the visual. It's about the outward appearance, what you dress like. Do you remember the lesson that God taught the prophet Samuel when he sent him to anoint a new king over Israel? And you read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 16, But it's verse 6 that I want to read to you, verse 6 and 7. When they came, these were all the prospective kings. One of the sons of Jesse was was going to be king. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And here God is teaching Samuel a huge lesson. It's got nothing to do or very little to do with the outward appearance. The most important thing is the heart. These scribes who were influencing people, it it was all about the visual. It was all about being seen and getting that platform. It it was all about having the right robes. It goes on to say they loved the greetings, the the best seats in the synagogue. So in the the public gatherings for worship, they wanted to be known and and have places of influence. And whenever there were feasts, they, they wanted the place of honor. Their goal within both church and culture was to be held up and revered and for others to imitate them. Everything about the scribe is outward. Inwardly, it was all about them. It didn't matter who got in their way. Widows throughout the the Old Testament are viewed as as the most vulnerable. And what Jesus says here about the scribes is they will take the most vulnerable and devour them. Even their spirituality is a pretense. It's all just about them. Beware of allowing people to influence you when their lives are all about outward show and display, and inwardly it's all just me, 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 me. Beware of people such as these. But it's not just about behavior. You see, scribes don't just influence behavior. Much, much more importantly, these are the ones who shape Belief. The the most significant people in your life are those who influence what you believe. Because if they can influence what you believe, that in itself shapes behavior. Listen to what Jesus says here in verse 35. This is him beginning his teaching in the temple. 
How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great crowd heard him gladly. So the the question that Jesus puts is, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? I was thinking about this for a good part of this past week, and my answer is that the scribes can say that the Christ is the son of David because he is. The the scribes, what they're teaching about the Christ is true. That they say he's the son of David because he is descended from the lineage of David just as David was promised in the Davidic covenant that the, the Messiah, the anointed one, would come from his lineage. So when Jesus says, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? I'm kind of scratching my head going, well, because he is. And here's the interesting thing about what Jesus is teaching us about how scribes influence our belief. It's not that the scribes were wrong in what they said. It's not that what they were saying wasn't true. The problem is they didn't give you all of it. They limited the teaching of Scripture to less than what was actually there. What Jesus does is he proves that by using Psalm 110, where where David, and he makes it absolutely clear here, David is speaking by the Holy Spirit. So, So God is speaking as David pens these words. When he declares, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And Jesus says, David calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? So David here is speaking about the anointed one, who we know from Scripture is going to be the son of David, just like the scribes teach. But there's so much more to it than that. Because how can David refer to one of his descendants as his Lord. Now, you you need to do a little bit of thinking about this because there's a pyramid scheme, okay? Let's think of it like that in in Israel. And at the top of it is the king, who in this instance here is David. And the only one above the king is God himself. Now, David has children, okay? And one of them we know is going to be the Christ, because it's made that clear in the Scriptures. Even the scribes teach that. But speaking about his son, David said, the Lord said to my Lord, who's, who's above him, so it's like David saying, God said to God, and yet the second God is David's son, How can that be? What Jesus is saying is what you find in the Scriptures is the Christ, the Messiah. It's not just that he's a descendant of David, that the scribes teach rightly. It teaches more than that. Somehow or other, the Christ is both man, descendant of David, and divine to such an extent that God refers to him as God. The Lord said to my Lord. So within the the Christ, there is both humanity and divinity somehow or other come together. The, The scribes taught one part, but certainly not all. That their teaching was in line with something that they could perhaps grasp and wrap their minds around. And it left them with no room whatsoever for mystery. It was like they'd they'd limited all of their belief system 
to the size of their brains, and that was it. So God was limited to what they could comprehend and nothing more. And when you remove mystery from the Christian faith, you actually remove the very basis for our worship. Beware the scribes. You see, what you believe influences how you behave. Let me read to you a quote that, uh, and this is not coming from a a Christian perspective. This was from an article in in a, a, a magazine called Psychology Today. And this is what it says. Your beliefs can shape your reality, not only by influencing your own behavior, but also by influencing other people's behavior from close relationship partners to complete strangers. They're saying what you believe, it it influences and shapes your reality. It, It influences and shapes your behavior. It also influences and shapes those who have relationships with you. And your beliefs can influence and shape the behavior of complete strangers. That was the position that the scribes occupied. Let me then apply this to to you and to me. What do you believe? Who were the influencers in you arriving at what you believe? The single most important question you ever have to answer is this one. What do you believe concerning the person of Jesus Christ? What do you believe? Who influenced the way you've answered that question? There's a story that I have heard told in both Baptist setting and pedo-baptist presbyterian settings and in both settings the women involved changed denomination it's a strange thing but it's a funny story i i do not believe it's true I, i think it's probably in the realm of myth but it gets across an important point the the story goes there was a a preacher. Now the question is, do we make him a Baptist or a pedo-Baptist? I suppose given that I'm a Baptist um, preacher, I should probably go, there was this Baptist minister, okay? And he was ferocious in wanting everybody to be of a Baptist persuasion. So he preached his heart out, and he believed he delivered his position in such or with such clarity and in such force that everyone in the church that Sunday evening would be convinced that he was right. He was so convinced of that, he decided he would take a show of hands. And he wanted everybody who agreed agreed with him to raise their hands to show that he had been so convincing. When they did that, he assumed that everyone had agreed with him. But just to make sure and to show everyone how persuasive he actually was, after he'd asked all those who agreed with him to raise their hands, he then asked if there was anyone here who disagreed with him to raise their hands. And as the story goes, this one little old lady put her hand up, showing that she disagreed with him and actually believed that babies should be baptized too. When he saw this, he was horrified. And he challenged her publicly to explain why she didn't agree with him. She responded by saying, well, my parents believed that babies should be baptized. My grandparents believed that babies should be baptized. And my great-grandparents believed that babies should be baptized. Therefore, I'm persuaded to be a pedo-baptist. Well, he was having none of this. And he said, well, let me ask you, if your parents were morons 
and your grandparents were morons, and your great-grandparents were morons, what would you be? And the little old lady said, well, I suppose if my great-grandparents were morons, and my grandparents were morons, and my parents were morons, by what I've witnessed here this evening, I would probably be a Baptist. Needless to say, I don't think he won her over. But why do you believe what you believe? Not about baptism, but about the person of Jesus Christ. Who do you say that he is? Who has influenced that decision? Beware of the scribes. Beware of those who've given you half the truth and not all of it. What Jesus is challenging us to do here is search out the truth. Figure out what you believe. And think about who's influenced you. Beware, watch out, pay attention to the scribes. Here you have the most significant figure in human history, in the most significant place on the planet. And what he's asking you is, what do you believe about me? What do you believe about the Christ? Once that question is answered correctly, everything else begins to be shaped by it. Everything. Outward behavior is no longer done simply to be seen, to be visible. The the focus is no longer upon self and what do I get from this. Rather, Rather, everything begins to be done for Christ. And in order to be seen by him and simply to please him. See, earlier in Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus asked his disciples, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him and said, You are the Christ. Here Jesus is saying, Who do you say that I am? Who do you say Jesus the Christ actually is? Now pay attention, he's saying, to who's influenced your answer. I don't expect people to believe things just because I say it. I don't expect that. My expectation is that as and when I preach, people will pick up the Scriptures and search the Scriptures to see if what I say lines up with them. That's my hope and my my expectation. I, I do not want people running around saying, well, Kenny said this, therefore that's what I believe. My hope and my expectation is people will say, I believe this because this is what the Bible says. What do you believe about the person of Jesus Christ? And my encouragement to you is to to pick up the Gospels and read them and come to a conclusion about the person of Jesus Christ for yourself. In that way, these gospels become the influencers in your life. Around just after the time Jesus lived, there was a a man called Josephus, uh, a historian, and what he sought to do was to, to write an account of Jewish history. And that's what he is remembered for. Just the writings of Josephus are an account of the history of the Jewish people. And he lived just after the time of Jesus, when people would have been speaking about Jesus and talking about what they'd seen. And Josephus is famous. No, he's not a Christian. He's a Jew writing Jewish history. And his famous line from his, his tome, his, his big book on history, is this. He, Jesus, was a good man. 
if it's lawful to call him a man because he was a doer of marvelous deeds. You you get this impression that Josephus is sitting down to write about Jesus, and even as he's writing, putting ink on the paper, he's thinking, yeah, but who is he? There's no doubt he was a good man. But is it even lawful to call him a man? The, the, The things that he did are astounding. Was he more than just a man? It's the question that Josephus is wrestling with as he writes his history. And what I find in the following chapters of Mark is that this Jesus, who was recognized as the Christ by Peter, who when he's asked later on in in chapters in Mark's gospel, are you the Christ? And he says, I am. This Jesus, who is recognized as the Christ, who was a doer of amazing deeds, recorded in Mark's gospel, he loved us so much. He went to the cross for us to pay for our sins, that the wrath of God would be dealt with, and that if we place our faith in him, we get set free, and we get an inheritance that is unimaginably glorious. And he did all of this because he loved loved us enough to set us free from our sin and so laid down our, his life for us. That's what I believe the Bible teaches about the person of Jesus Christ. What do you believe? Pay attention to. Look out for, think about those who've influenced the way you answer that question. And my plea to you would be to pick up the Gospels and read about who Jesus is. Allow them to influence what you believe about the person of Jesus Christ. The most significant person in human history stood in the most significant place on the face of the earth. And effectively what he's saying to you is, What do you believe concerning me? I want to pray for us now as we think about that. Father, when we finally stand before the judgment seat of you, God Almighty, We will have no accolades to present before you that could somehow impress you. None of us have lived lives which come anywhere near perfection. Instead, everything we do is tainted with sin and rebellion. So often the motivating factors in our hearts are no different than those of the scribes. Where we love to be seen to be doing well. We love to be thought of well. We like those places of honor. Father, we stand condemned. And yet, Father, in your tender mercy, your beloved Son was found as God incarnate, living the life we couldn't. And in his death, taking our punishment and judgment upon himself. Oh, Father, how thankful we are that in and through him, before your judgment throne, we have a means of redemption whereby we can be clothed with his righteousness and inherit a glorious eternity. Father, help us to think about who he is. Father, may our understanding be formed and shaped by your word, which is true more than anything else. 
May we believe true things about Christ. So Father, from the scriptures, as we read the gospels, may they influence what we believe about Christ. May they influence more than anything else or anyone else. May our beliefs be rooted in Scripture alone. That your word has that supreme authority in our lives. Help us come to a right understanding about the person of Jesus who is the Christ. Father, for any who've tracked through this with us and they're thinking about these things even now, Father, be pleased to give them time and opportunity to research your Son for themselves. Hear our prayers. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I'm going to close by introducing a a hymn. As always, hopefully it will appear in the corner up here. And it's one that speaks about just the greatness of our God. And I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.